Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming to this Golden Summit Fellowship webinar today. It's a beautiful sunny Saturday, so thank you all for being extremely proactive in prioritizing your career um, to learn about the unspoken rules and for taking the time to support the North American Mabel Cultural Center today. More importantly, Gorik, thank you so much for taking the time out of your beautiful Saturday evening um, to share with us your book, your work, your stories and insights with us tonight. <laughs> um, before launching straight into Gorik's discussion about the unspoken rules, I'd like to make several acknowledgements. Um, the first is the North American Maple Culture Center for hosting this workshop. Zhang Si, who doesn't have her camera on right now, but is the big puppeteer behind pulling all the strings, um, is, the, is the organizer for the events that we hold here. Um, she's the chairwoman of the American Chinese Drama Association. She's directed over 100 plays, and she's the president of the North American Maple Culture Association. Today, we'll be having Dr. Ellen Yen as a Chinese translator um, throughout the program. And before we launch right into Gork, uh, my name is Mina Liang. I'm incredibly honored to be hosting our discussion this evening. Um, many of you guys know me and see me wearing a lot of different hats, but today I will be representing the Miss America organization as a candidate competing for Miss Massachusetts. Um, I'm passionate about creating resources, discussion, and space for students, in particularly those of non-traditional backgrounds, to gain accessibility to knowledge um, and role models that are leading the forefront of management, whether that be in government, education, or business. Uh, personally, as the daughter of two Chinese immigrants, um, Gork's work in creating, uh, just paving the forefront for immigrant children and opening up transparency about the barriers that exist in the workplace, whether due to socioeconomic, racial, or cultural, um, means so much to me and so much to what I do uh, with the Miss America organization. Um, so I'm really, really excited to have you here with us, Gork, today. Uh, I'll do a short introduction for Gork, but not to take away your own introduction. Gorg is a Wall Street Journal best-selling author of The Unspoken Rules, Secret to Starting Your Career Off-Right. Gorg is a career advisor at Harvard College, specializing in coaching first-generation low-income students. Born and raised in Toronto to a single mother who dropped out of school at age 12 to work in a sewing factory. Um, at age 14, Gorg was the sole force between his mother and himself, and he spent a lot of his young years searching online for jobs and writing resumes and cover letters, which is crazy. Um, and his experience, which I'm not going to talk too much about because this is his story, but as an outsider of the system prompted his passion in understanding the unknown unknowns of the workplace. He has worked in management consulting at Boston Consulting Group. He's been investing banking at Credit Suisse and is a researcher with the Managing the Future of Work Project at Harvard. Thank you so much for being with us, Gorg. It is a pleasure and an honor to host you and the floor is all yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Director Zhang, thank you for having me. Dr. Yan, thank you for your wonderful translation. Mina, thank you for organizing. It's an honor to be here today. It's an honor to be in the presence of all of you, and especially Dr. Zhang, for really paving the way for so many of us Asian Americans. Representation is something that I have been thinking more and more about so much of as I've embarked upon this book project, I've been thinking more and more about the importance of representation, of being able to see someone who looks like you, has the same backgrounds as you, ascending to a position of leadership. And that's someone that Mina is doing for, for young people that Dr. Yan and uh, Director Zhang have done for so many of us in the Asian community. So to be in the presence of all of you really is an honor. Thank you for taking the time today and thank you for being here. Well, so I'm going to now start sharing my screen with a presentation that I'll be sharing with you all today. It's called How to Succeed in Your Summer Internship or Full-Time Job. For those of you who are early in your careers, I hope that this will help set you up for success this summer. For those of you who are leaving school and entering the workforce, I hope this helps you get further, faster in your careers. For those of you who are later on in your careers, I hope this provides you with some frameworks on how to transition into a new project and to navigate unfamiliar spaces. And for managers who are here today, I hope that this provides some frameworks around some of the invisible obstacles 
that may be present that can separate someone who ends up being successful in the workplace versus someone who ends up struggling in the workplace. Wonderful. So let's get started where I will get started with a little bit more about me. I think Mina did an excellent job and a very generous job of introducing who I am. I was born and raised in Toronto, Canada, here in the red dot. My mom left school when she was 12 years old to work in a sewing machine factory. After high school, I was lucky enough to have entered Harvard College as a first generation low income college student. And it was at Harvard that I understood for the first time the invisible barriers that may separate those who end up navigating to positions of leadership successfully from those who struggle. The story that comes to mind is one in sophomore year of college where I was walking home from the library one night after working in the library on my homework assignment. I was wearing jeans and a t-shirt walking home off to bed. Meanwhile, there were students who were walking in the other direction who were dressed in suits. It turns out that these students were invited to an invite only recruiting event put on by an employer that had come onto campus. This employer had brought a number of free swag. So water bottles, stickers, notebooks, pens, etc. And when I showed up, all I saw was this free sweat, not realizing hidden out that there's an unspoken rule at these job fairs, that it's not just about learning about these companies, it's about building relationships, relationships that ultimately lead to you getting pulled from the candidate pool into getting a job. And so I walked away from this recruiting fair with a bunch of free plastic toys, not realizing that there was a hidden opportunity to walk away with an internship. And that's what these other students ended up doing. I looked left, I looked right, and I started realizing that there was so much that I didn't know I didn't know, but that others knew. It was really, I was feeling like this dog of not having an idea of what I was doing. This ended up leading to a five-year-long research project where I realized that I don't know what I don't know, but others know. People who've come before me, people who have made the mistake so I didn't have to. And so all I had to do was find them and learn from them. And so over the last five years, I ended up speaking to over 500 individuals across geographies, industries, and job types to understand what they wish someone could, could have told them earlier about how to survive and thrive in the early stages of your career. Three years later, I ended up releasing a new book just last month called The Unspoken Rules, Secrets to Starting Your Career Off Right. I want to now illustrate how two people can encounter the same situation, but come to two very different outcomes in the workplace. And I want to illustrate with person A versus person B. On the y-axis, on the vertical line, I have promotability, which means how likely someone is to receive more important responsibilities, to receive higher profile assignments, and ultimately to receive a promotion to ascend to a position of leadership. On the horizontal line on the x-axis, I have tenure, which is to say how long an individual has been at a particular company, in a particular department, or in a particular position. And so I start off from, let's say, minus 10 days, 10 days before someone joins, all the way through to, let's say, two years. Now, this isn't to scale. So we could extend this out to five years, 10 years. And of course, the dates along the way are not to scale either. I'm using this really as a way of illustrating how two people can be in the same environment, but come to two very different outcomes. So let's dive into what person A might experience. Person A is a high performer. And this person even before the first day, minus five days, maybe he gets introduced to a colleague. And so learns about the inner workings of this organization, learns who is who and what they care about, so that by the first day, they're showing up looking and sounding like an insider. So they appear competent on day one. 
On day two, they're bonding with a manager about their favorite vacation spot or their favorite TV show. So they turn someone who's an otherwise a stranger into an ally. So that by the time day 10 rolls around, they're getting more confident. And as a result, they have the confidence now to maybe reach out to a colleague who may have graduated from their university and asks them for their input on a project prior to delivering a presentation for another team or department. So by the time they show up at this event, they're exceeding expectations because they're saying the right things to the right people. And as a result, looking and sounding competent. From this meeting, they meet someone else who ends up inviting them to an after work social. And so they have an opportunity now to build yet another ally with some of these higher ups. They're meeting even more people, including a potential mentor. And after this meeting, they end up meeting one-on-one -on -one with this individual. And from this individual, they get introduced to two more people. And so they're meeting more people now. Their social circle is improving and growing in this company and building allies and mentors along the way. At the same time, this person's building more confidence and they're building a greater awareness of who cares about what and where the organization is going. So they're speaking up more now in sub solid meetings and they're catching the attention of even more higher ups to the point where they're getting invited to higher profile assignments and they're building again, that level of confidence. So that by the time two years rolls around or however long, they have no issues getting promoted. Now that's the journey of person A. What about person B, a low performer or a mediocre performer? Well, this person may not have been aware that there were any of these unspoken rules. So they're not doing very much before their first day. Maybe they show up overdressed or underdressed and they're looking and feeling like an outsider. Maybe they don't feel all that comfortable in this new environment and so stay quiet. Not because they don't have anything to say, not because they don't wanna contribute, but because they're maybe feeling a little bit less comfortable. But people can't read this individual's mind and so this person looks and sounds disengaged. Maybe when they receive an assignment, they're not asking the right questions or managing expectations or asking for clarification. So maybe they're doing the wrong work and not because they're incompetent, but because they look incompetent. And at the same time, they're maybe getting micromanaged. So they're not maybe doing the right work. Their manager is getting worried about their progress and so what was otherwise an opportunity to maybe build a relationship with their manager ends up degrading into maybe micromanagement. And this person continues working, but starts getting frustrated now and loses confidence. Maybe they have performance anxiety and stays even more quiet than they were when they were first starting out. And they are now wondering, they're looking at someone like person A and wondering, how is it that this person is going through this so easily and building so many relationships. What do they know that I don't know? However, before they even get a chance to be promoted in the same way that person A was, they end up quitting. Now, these are two extremes. I think of these as bookends to what you could encounter. Of course, few of us will be person A or person B. However, it is helpful to think about what the extremes look like because this allows us to now diagnose our own situation to understand to what extent might we be encountering situations similar to those of person A or, in, or navigating situations like a person A or a person B. Because what we observe in this situation is that success isn't something that happens overnight. It's something that is a snowball that keeps rolling and keeps growing over time. And there's this accumulated advantage over time where small decisions, small, subtle tweaks in the way we navigate unfamiliar situations can go on to really magnify your impact in a work environment. So let me pause here uh, to, sh to, to, to allow the translation, but I really wanna start with this just to show you what's possible. Um, so as we think about person A versus person B, of course, there are certain things that are within our control and there are certain things that are outside of our control. As a guide for the individual, my goal is to help equip as many people as possible to become someone like person A over someone like person B. It's also going at odds with this idea that hard work will pay off on its own. Hard work is only the price of admission. To survive and thrive, you need something more. 
something that person A has been able to do. And so what's going on here? What's going on here is can be captured through a framework that I call the three C's, which stand for competence, commitment, and compatibility. And the idea is this, when you show up professionally, whether it's in a cover letter, in an interview, in an interaction with a coworker, on your first day in a new role, at a client meeting, et cetera, the people around you are sizing you up and evaluating you. And they're asking themselves three questions. Question one is, can you do this job well? Which is competence. Question two is, are you excited to be here? Which is commitment. And question three is, do you get along with us? Which is compatibility. Competence, commitment, compatibility, the three C's. Your job, all of our jobs, is to convince the people around us to answer yes to all three questions all the time. Now, different people are also going to have to travel different distances to get to the center, depending on how well you relate to your coworkers, depending on how familiar you are with your work environment, whether you have a background in the position you're taking on, you may have a longer distance to travel than someone else. However, and of course, given invisible barriers in the workplace, whether it's bias or discrimination, it may not necessarily be possible in every environment to get to the center. However, as I think about someone like person A, they were able to flex and demonstrate and really maximize their competence, their commitment and compatibility at every turn. So as I think about the three C's and I think about what school may condition us to believe, in school, it's all about getting your job done which is really about completing your assigned tasks. However, to be successful as a professional, doing your job is only part of your job. There's a larger circle that surrounds the small circle and it represents everything else. And so doing your job is only part of your job. In corporate America, and I would argue for much of the world, the rest is performative, more than our seemingly meritocratic society is willing to admit that it's not just about your technical skills, it's about your soft skills. It's not just about your book smarts, it's also about your street smarts. We've heard these phrases mentioned a lot, but it really does play a role in whether someone is able to be successful at work. And so here's an example quote of someone that I interviewed. Her name is Sarah Liang, no relation to Mina. This is actually a pseudonym. This is an individual that I interviewed who is a manager at an accounting firm. And she encapsulates for me what so many people who struggle in the workplace struggle to realize, perhaps until it's too late. And so let me read this quote, which is, so many of my Asian friends see small talk as taking a break. When I bill my hours as an accountant, there's no category for networking. Does that mean I have to do eight full hours of work each day? I used to, until I noticed that no one gets ahead by keeping their head down. And so what does this look like, these three C's that we're all trying to navigate in the workplace? Well, when I think about the trajectories of person A versus person B and how we go about demonstrating the three C's at every turn, I think about what individuals can do on day zero, so before you even join a company, week one, month one, and beyond. And then as I think about the book that I wrote, which I hope you'll all consider checking out, it's really about mapping what one can do before their first day all the way through to a promotion so that you can map your trajectory in the same way that person A was able to. And of course, we're not gonna have time tonight to talk about every single tactic. It's, there's a lot to cover in over 250 pages, but I'm going to distill some of the highlights and some of my favorite tactics over the course of these five steps. And so at a high level, which we're going to go into more detail in a bit, I think about day zero is all about doing your background research, embracing networking calls, St stalking your coworkers, which we'll talk about shortly, setting up your workspace, 
which we won't go into very much detail on because that's setting up Zoom, which for those of you who are in university, you've spent so much time uh, covering this already of looking presentable from the waist up. So I don't need to talk about that. And then most importantly, reflecting on what you want out of the experience. Week one is all about knowing the expectations, sparking conversations, which then lead to month one, where you're able to take ownership, stay on track, so that later on, you're able to show your potential. So we're going to go into a little bit more detail on each of these just as a high, at a high level. But at an even higher level, this is what your trajectory looks like following the journey of someone like person A. So let's now talk about day zero and what you can do. So the first is to do your background research. What does that mean? One of the exercises that I noticed individuals doing is a fill in the blank exercise. Now, no one is consciously filling in these blanks, but this can be a framework for you to understand the broader context that you're entering into. So the first is my employer slash client helps these clients do these things by these methods. Blank number two is recently my employer slash client has been doing these things to achieve these goals. Blank three is my employer slash client competes with these organizations because of these reasons. Or you can also replace this with partners or customers where you can say my employer's clients work on these topics because of these reasons. And then finally, number four is this person is my manager and these people are my colleagues. Now, think back to when you were in an interview setting. Inevitably, you're going to receive up to three questions right at the very get-go. One, tell me about yourself. Two, what position? Why are you interested in this position? And question three, why are you interested in this company? And for many people who are looking for jobs and interviewing, they often give a vague response, such as, well, I'm interested in working at Google because I'm interested in in tech and working in a tech company. Well, of course, that's, that's better than saying nothing, but a better answer is to be able to talk about the particular initiative that maybe this team has been working on that you're really excited about to show that you've done your homework, that you're not just applying everywhere, that even if you are applying everywhere, and you don't have to tell everyone this, that you have a thoughtful reason for picking this company and this position in particular. And when you show up in the job, inevitably your coworkers are going to start asking you, well, what got you interested in this position in the first place? In which case at the same time, being able to say something like, oh, I was reading about your recent initiative on this and it relates to my background because in university I was working on this project for class and I took this course and I had these internships and these extracurricular activities. So as I think about what I'd like to do in the future, the mission of your team and the efforts that you're working on really speak to me. That's an A++ answer of how to answer these questions, but it's based on your knowledge of what this organization has been up to, which is very different from being able to say just a vague answer of, oh, uh, and, and some people will actually give maybe far from an A++ answer, which is, well, this was the only job I got, <laughs> which may be honest, but it's, not what people are interested in hearing. And then finally, I have a story in my book of someone who walked into the elevator on their first day at a large bank in New York City. And this person stood next to the CEO and didn't know the CEO's name and didn't know that they were the CEO. And so here's an individual who could have built a relationship with someone that is at the very top of the company, but because they didn't understand who's who, they missed out on that opportunity and not only did they miss out on this opportunity, they actually embarrassed themselves by mistaking the CEO for someone else. So if you haven't done these fill-in-the-blank exercises before, consider trying it out. Consider doing this for your coming interview. If you are in a job already, consider filling these blanks and seeing which of these are you able to fill out and encouraging yourself to do this exercise when you start a new project because it really helps you pull away from the day-to-day -day work and see the big picture. And once we get beyond knowing the expectations, 
now it's time to spark conversations of turning people who are otherwise strangers into acquaintances and from acquaintances into allies and allies into mentors. And so, so much of work is all about finding excuses to turn someone from acquaintance to ally or from stranger to acquaintance. And so in a workplace, especially if you're working remotely, it can be difficult to find these opportunities because you're not interfacing with your coworkers as frequently. So what are the people like person A doing? Well, maybe they're joining meetings early and having that opportunity to interact with their coworkers in a casual setting, even if it's for two minutes. Maybe they're asking about people's work and showing an interest in what other people are doing and using the research skills that they've done, that they've applied and showing interest in, oh, wow, it looks like you're working on this. I just read this recent report. I thought of you. Maybe you'd find this interesting. Maybe asking questions in general. If you, for example, aren't able to necessarily relate to your coworkers' weekend trips and vacation plans and favorite movies and TV shows and music choices, you can at least show an interest by asking questions like, oh, I've never been there before. What's it like? So much of this is really just latching on to those little hidden opportunities to build compatibility. And then once you learn something about an individual, remembering details and following up. And of course, repeating some of the research that you've been doing before your first day on an ongoing basis. One of the things that becomes a habit for many people like person A is just making it a habit to go on to LinkedIn, for example, and seeing who they're about to interact with and asking questions when they're in the room, remembering, details about their coworkers, following up, really just investing in the relationship. One of the things that I think about when I present a slide like this is how much of this almost can feel like common sense. It feels like common sense, but I also often get the question of, well, how do I network? Networking is one of these words that people often have an allergy to, of it sounds transactional, it sounds uncomfortable, but when I think of networking, we all have done it before. We just may not have used the word networking. In fact, if you've ever been to kindergarten, for example, which all of us have, what are we doing on the playground? We're not hopefully pushing the other kid off the slide. We're sharing, we're talking, we're learning about each other and we're turning classmates that we didn't know before on our first day of kindergarten into friends. So much of compatibility building in the workplace is very similar. It's as if we, over the course of school, forget that actually networking is what you did in elementary school. It's just applying it to our professional lives, something that we often forget about, but that is so important to becoming someone like person A. Now, of course, it's not just about relationship building. We've talked a lot about relationship building and the importance of compatibility. But compatibility is just one of these three C's. There's also, of course, competence. You need to do your job well and do what you say you will do. In this case, it's all about taking ownership, which is this mindset of not just thinking about the task you've been assigned, but taking a step back, seeing the bigger picture and asking yourself, what problem am I trying to solve? And how can I manage this process from beginning to end? That's what separates someone who's promotable from someone who may be good in their current jobs, but that people may not be thinking about for a promotion. So what, is, what does it look like for someone to take ownership? Well, they are asking what, how, by when. This is actually one of the things that I really missed out on when I was starting out, which is when your manager gives you an assignment, it's important to ask yourself three questions. One, what do I need to do? Two, how do I need to do it? And three, by when do I need to do it? Otherwise, you'll do the wrong work, do it the wrong way, or not do it on time, which sounds intuitive. But when I start thinking about the assignments I got at work, my manager was often saying to me, hey, can you look into this? Which isn't clear at all on what the what, the how, and the by when should be. And in the workplace, if you have, for example, a client meeting next Friday, that's the end deadline. There are other invisible and unspoken deadlines of, for example, if your client presentation is on Friday and your manager is away on Thursday and you can't meet with your manager until you meet with someone else on Tuesday, but that person's away on Tuesday and so you need to talk to them on Friday, 
well, your deadline isn't next Friday, it may be this Wednesday. In which case, if you don't clarify those expectations and work backwards from the deadline, you could end up looking incompetent, even though you were perfectly competent, you just didn't take ownership of the situation. So much of this is also about making sure that what your manager said is in alignment with what you thought they said. And so I notice this behavior among people like person A, which is to say, sounds good. I'll send you a calendar invitation for this afternoon. I'll send it to you right after this meeting or simply saying, sounds good. I'll contact this person and CC you. These are all little behaviors that come across as common sense and just really naturally but is really taking control of the situation, making sure that what your manager said, you're repeating back to them. And when it comes to the by when, making sure you're asking, hey, would it, when would it make sense to check in? So that that way you're not like person B and spending maybe five hours on an assignment. You're clarifying expectations so that you're on track with a five minute task before you move on to the five hour task. And when you're asking questions, you're yeah. maybe, doing your homework and making sure that you're able to answer the question yourself and then going to your manager with questions that you couldn't have answered yourself. And when you're doing so, maybe you're saying to your manager, I've got five questions for you. So that way you're not asking your manager one question five separate times every five minutes. You're asking five questions in one sitting. And then finally, it's making sure that you have an answer whenever your manager asks you a question. So here, it's all about thinking to yourself, what is my manager likely to ask me about? And what is my manager likely to ask me for? So if your manager is likely to ask you about, hey, how is this going? The answer is, well, you should have an answer before they ask. And then when it comes to what your manager might ask you for, if your manager asks you for a week, uh, an end of week update, making sure that you're giving it to them before they even ask. So, so much of taking ownership is really about just taking control of the situation, which is maybe obvious for those of you who have worked before, but may not be obvious to someone who's coming straight out of school. Because in school, we're given the next assignment. We're told when every assignment is due. And every assignment contains clear instructions at the top. Maybe you have fill in the blanks where you have only five options to choose between. The answers to every question are at the back of the textbook. There's so much more ambiguity in the workplace that requires you to clarify and take control because no one else would do this for you. Great. And then finally, it's about staying on track. One of the other things that I didn't appreciate when I was transitioning from school to work is that in school, you have a report card. You have a grade at the top of every assignment so you know if you are on track. However, in the workplace, often feedback will not come frequently at all, or you may not receive it at all. In which case, it's important to ask your manager for feedback before these promotion decisions come up. In which case, here are two ways that people have found helpful in asking for feedback. One is to ask, what should I start doing, stop doing, and keep doing? Which is a slightly different framing to asking questions, because if you ask, do you have any feedback for me? Often managers will say, no, you're doing great. When really they do have feedback, it's just that they're too awkward, uh, too non-confrontational to tell you what you need to hear and are instead telling you what you want to hear. One example I have is someone who interned at a tech company who was told by their manager that they were doing really well, but then at the end of the internship didn't end up getting a full-time job offer. And it turns out that this person was working too slowly was not doing the right work, was misprioritizing, and wasn't being told at all because their manager wanted to make them feel good. However, behind the scenes, this manager was actually complaining behind this intern's back about them not understanding expectations, about being a low performer. In which case, when this intern, who was a software engineer at a big tech company, what she told me was one question would have solved so much of this this situation and it was am i on track am i on track to turn this internship into a full-time job offer am i on track to turn this contract role into a full-time role am i on track to be promoted in the next cycle assuming that this is something that's transparent in the organization so again 
going from taking ownership of your tasks to ultimately taking ownership of how you're performing in the workplace, because no one will care as much about your promotability and your performance as you will. So if others don't tell you, you need to seek this out on your own. Great. And I'll leave you all with one last quote, which is the following, which is that your job may be temporary, but your relationships, your reputation, who you know, what you learn could last a lifetime. And this is one of the things that I observe a lot among advisees that, that I have at Harvard, for example, who may look at an opportunity as, oh, well, this is just a volunteer experience, or this is just an internship. I'm not excited about being here long term. I'm never going to meet these people again. However, what these people may not appreciate is that there are more, there's more than one type of capital. When we think of capital, we think of time and money, where you can spend time, you can spend money, but there are actually other forms of capital. There's social capital in terms of who you know. There is human capital in terms of what you can do. And there's also reputational capital, which is who knows you and for what and how positive their impressions are of you. And these five forms of capital really create the basis of our careers. And so having a longer term view of how all these different pieces fit together long term will make sure that you're on the path to getting to where you want to be and will take a smoother path to getting there versus seeing opportunities as short term, as transactional, as really just about putting your head down, doing what you're told and not doing much else. So really thinking about this in the context of your broader career will set you up to start your career off right and set yourself up to have the career that you want.